Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University's South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program podcast, also known as the GWEP podcast. We are here to educate, encourage, enhance our knowledge and skills, and promote all those amazing health professions experts working with the elderly, including caregivers and interprofessional teams. My name is Dr. Hattie Masri, and I am an associate professor at Karan C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University, as well as a geriatrician and subject matter expert for the South Florida Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program. In today's episode, we are taking an in-depth look at hearing with our subject matter expert, Dr. Patricia Gaffney. Patricia Gaffney is a professor at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She earned her bachelor's degree from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and her doctor of audiology from the University of Pittsburgh. Previously, she worked at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Miami. She joined the audiology department at NSU in 2007. Her specialty is vestibular diagnostics and treatment. At NSU, she teaches the vestibular and amplification courses. In addition, she is a clinical preceptor for the first and second year audiology students in the audiology clinic. Dr. Gaffney has presented at various national and state meetings on various topics, including vestibular, amplification, and professional issues. Dr. Gaffney also maintains memberships in several organizations, volunteers for various committees, and has previously served on the board of directors for the American Academy of Audiology, the American Academy of Audiology Foundation, the American Balance Society, and president of the Audiology Practice Standards Organization. Dr. Gaffney, welcome. Thank you for having me. Can we start by you telling us why this topic is important to you? Well, so as an audiologist, hearing is the primary thing that we look at. So I've been an audiologist 18 years now, and hearing is such a critical component for communication and just being involved in your life with other people. And so I think hearing is a really important topic that often gets overlooked or downplayed in society and by other health professionals. So for the podcast audience, can you share what health professions should know about hearing loss in the elderly? Sure. So, you know, hearing loss is a sense that we consider an invisible disability. It's not something where you can look at somebody and see that they have hearing loss. And people are really good at masking it. They come up with communication strategies to kind of bluff their way through different communication situations when they can't hear what's going on. And so with health professionals, I think that they need to know that they're are people who have hearing loss that are masking it. People who are elderly have a higher incidence of and prevalence of hearing loss. And that there are things that we can do to improve hearing like amplification or hearing aids. If you had one magic wish to make for hearing in terms of research, clinical care or education, what would it be? One magic wish. Okay, so When we look at hearing loss, the majority of hearing loss is what we consider sensory neural hearing loss. And in most cases, it's the little tiny hair cells that are in the inner ear that are damaged, and that's what's causing the hearing loss. And one avenue of research that's been going on for a really long time is hair cell regeneration. So the hair cells that you're born with are the hair cells you have your entire life. And so when we look at, you know, older adults, those little hair cells are just worn out after, you know, decades of use. And so hair cell regeneration would be to basically regenerate or replace them. But the literature or, and the research that's being done on that isn't really coming to fruition very quickly. There's a lot of caveats to it. So that kind of one magic wish would be that we could kind of find the magic algorithm to create hair cell regeneration that works in people. What is the term presbycusis? So presbycusis is the term for age-related hearing loss. So presby meaning aging. So we see that in other things like presbyopia. So presbycusis is age-related hearing loss. Okay. As a family physician, is there any tip-offs I should look for as far as uh, sending this patient to a specialist like yourself? So we can divide concerns about hearing into two categories. So we have the more 
emergent red flag category, and then we have this more subtle, gradual change in hearing. So when we look at the more red flags that people need to be seen pretty immediately are any sort of sudden hearing loss. Somebody wakes up and now they can't hear or all of a sudden their hearing drops out. You know, anything that is unilateral, so if they're getting only hearing loss on one side or only tinnitus on one side, those would be the more red flag things that need a more urgent approach versus the more gradual approach. So when we look at research, pretty much when people start getting into their later 50s, this emergence of the presbyacusis starting. So you can kind of look at it from decade of life. You can also look at it as people who have subtle changes, like they're noticing that people are either mumbling or they're asking to repeat or they're having to turn the TV up. So very simple questions about how people are doing with listening in their daily life. One of the other things is that people have difficulty in background noise, and that often becomes out first before people start noticing it in a quiet one-on-one -on -one environment. So asking people, are they struggling to hear in noisy environments? Now it's kind of a double-edged sword because if you have normal hearing, you can also have difficulty in those noisy environments depending on how noisy it is. But at an average restaurant, if somebody's having some difficulties, it might be time for a hearing evaluation. You also mentioned that term tinnitus. Could you tell the audience what Sure. Tinnitus or tinnitus? Both are correct. So okay. you can either say tinnitus or you can say tinnitus. Depends on kind of where you are originally from geographically. There's kind of this, this differential divide, but it's the same thing. So it's any sort of noise that's being generated from quote unquote the ear. It's really coming more from the brain. It can be described as a ringing, a hissing, a roaring. Uh, some people say it sounds like crickets or static. And quite honestly, everybody has a small amount amount of tinnitus. It's really just the internal noise in your head. Um, but when people have hearing loss, because they are not getting all of the sounds in their environment related to the hearing loss, it starts to uncover that sound um, in your brain. So if I took somebody who has normal hearing, put them in one of our sound booths where it's very, very quiet, the majority of people are going to hear a small amount of tinnitus. But what happens with the hearing loss is with that uncovering, it becomes more and more present throughout your day. It starts to interfere with communication, particularly sleeping at night and in a quiet room and all you're hearing is this, this ringing or noise in your head. It starts to become more intrusive into people's lives and it can be really bothersome for people. Is one-sided tinnitus of significance? You mentioned that too. Yeah, so anytime that we see somebody who has unilateral symptoms, so one-sided tinnitus or hearing loss, the one thing we always want to rule out is an acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. It's the same thing because that typically presents unilateral. Most people who have hearing loss that's age-related, it's usually bilateral. So in those cases, somebody's going to experience tinnitus in both ears versus that one-sided approach. Now, there's some research coming out about untreated hearing loss and cognitive decline. Could you expand upon that? Sure. So yeah, this has been a really interesting new line of research that's been coming out probably over the past, I would say, eight years or so. This was really spearheaded by Frank Lynn, who's a physician at Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. And yeah, so what they're seeing is that individuals who have even just a mild amount of hearing loss, that over time there's a higher rate of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia when those people are untreated. So basically they're not wearing hearing aids. And there's a couple of reasons why they think that's happening. One is that our ears are really like use it or lose it kind of phenomenon. So when you have hearing loss and you have those damaged hair cells, then you're also not stimulating that part of the cochlea, then you're not st stimulating that portion of the eighth nerve that goes up to the brain, which that means you're not stimulating that part of the auditory cortex. And so we see this decline or atrophy in the cortical components of the auditory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe. So part of the theory is that there's this atrophy of that component of the brain. You're also losing out on social cues, right? So you're not being able to communicate and, and overall untreated hearing loss, you see this big shift towards social isolation because they struggle with communicating with people. It just becomes burdensome. And so they stop answering the phone, they stop going out to dinner, they stop doing all these things. And when you're not getting that mental stimulation, you're 
not using other components of your brain either. So there's a few theories out there on why that's happening. And so now it's really considered one of the modifiable risks for dementia that if somebody does have hearing loss, that we should be fitting them with amplification, even if it's very mild. So that would require them having hearing aids. What are the advantages of getting hearing aids? Sure. So I think we have to have a realistic approach of what hearing aids really are. So they're just amplifiers, right? So they're just taking a sound and turning it up. They're programmed to give more volume to the place where you have more hearing loss and hearing aids have some other features involved. So the advantage of that is that you're getting that volume where you need it, where you have hearing difficulties. And so when we look at people who have hearing loss, as I mentioned before, social isolation is is a really big component and social isolation can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety, you start to lose connection with family and friends. And so one of the biggest advantages of wearing hearing aids is being able to communicate with other people and be able to be part of society and, and function in, in the rest of the world. Are there different types of hearing aids? We can look at hearing aids from both the style of what they look like as well as the technology. So we have different styles of hearing aids. So there's ones that go all the way in the ear canal where you can't see them. So they're invisible in the canal. That's what they're actually called, IIC. IIC. Yeah, so IICs are invisible in the canal and they kind of work their way up bigger so that they fill the whole ear canal or whole ear in the the part of the pinna, the conchable called in the ear, ITE. And then we have models that go behind the ear. So there's the BTE or behind the ear, which is a little bit larger. And now we have the most common style, which is the receiver in the canal, which is a very small component that goes behind the ear, a little tiny wire that goes down to a little tip that goes into the ear canal. So that one is really cosmetically appealing and it has a lot of technology in it unlike the IICs which is cosmetically appealing but you can't put as much technology in it because it's so small. When we look at the technology side we have products that go from a you know basic amplifier with some programming and some different noise cancelers all the way up to a more premium product which has a lot of flexibility as far as programming lots of programs that we can put into it, lots of noise reduction strategies. So there's a wide range of the levels of technology that are in there. And I understand sometimes my patients complain about using the uh, hearing aids as far as compliancy because their complaints were they have to change out the batteries every so often. So is there any way to mitigate that? We've seen a really big increase in rechargeable batteries, which has made life a lot easier for a lot of people. There are still devices that require a traditional zinc air battery, and the smaller de the device, typically the, the less time that battery lasts for. So like that IIC hearing aid is so tiny that the battery also has to be tiny, so they only last about three to five days, where some of the larger hearing aids you can get about two weeks out of the battery. But the lithium ion rechargeable batteries have really been a game changer for a lot of individuals where you know they wear the hearing aid all day they you know just like how they would plug their phone in or you know put it on the charging pad you're just gonna take your hearing aids off at night put them in the little charging case and then they're ready to go in the morning so that has been a really big improvement for hearing aids and compliance with that as well right. so and another... reduced cost too so people aren't having to buy batteries all the time right another complaint is they lose their hearing aids so traditionally by insurance, what is covered yes. um, with hearing aids? Yeah, so losing hearing aids is, is a problem. As far as from the, the more technical side and insurance side and, and manufacturer side, so hearing aids come with a warranty. They actually come with two different types of warranties. They come with um, a repair warranty. So if anything happens and it needs to be repaired, you can send it in. And those warranties can be anywhere from one to three years. And then they also have a loss and damage warranty. So if it's lost or damaged beyond repair, like the dog eats it, it gets run over by a car, somebody, theirs went down the you know garbage disposal and got chopped up a little bit. In those cases, you can replace it once under the loss and damage. Um, right. component. Are, are you talking specifically about Medicare or Medicaid? Oh, so that's from the manufacturer. Mm. As far as, you know, insurance coverage, so Medicare does nothing with hearing aids at this time. And that's a big issue, particularly with this 
population, talking about older adults um, who are all on Medicare. Medicare doesn't cover hearing aids, so they're not going to be involved at all in this. Medicaid does vary based on the state. In the state of Florida, they will replace hearing aids once every three years. If it's lost, we can usually, you know, petition for a replacement, and it would be replaced under warranty as well, the manufacturer warranty. But Medicaid in Florida will replace hearing aids every three years. How much is a hearing aid, or a pair of hearing aids, rather? Yeah, so hearing aids, depending on where you go and where you live, so the average hearing aid costs about four to five thousand dollars, but you can really see it range from a more basic device around two thousand, twenty five hundred, up to six. I have heard of hearing aids go for nine thousand dollars in some high cost areas like LA, New York, where just everything is more expensive. But the average cost is about you know four to five thousand dollars for a pair. And you were talking about the latest advantages. I hear that you could introduce the internet and a whole bunch of other things. You want to expand on that? Yeah, so this is a fun time for amplification because we've seen a lot of really cool changes happen, especially with the ability with Bluetooth. The biggest thing that people love is that you can stream from your devices to your hearing aids. So you get a phone call, you answer it on your phone, or you can answer it from your hearing aid, and it will stream that audio straight to your hearing aids. Or if you're listening to movies or YouTube, or anything like that from your device, you can stream it to your hearing aids. So that's one of the things that people love the most. But there's some other really cool things. One manufacturer in particular has like a translation um, option in their high-end product where you can use it with Google Translate and it will translate into the hearing aids what is being said, which is really cool. I've, I've tried it out and it's really cool. It's a little slow, but I'm sure over time that'll improve. That's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. there's also, so you talk talked about lost hearing aids. There's also apps on the phone with your hearing aids paired to the app. You can actually find them. So there's a find option. So if you think you lost them, you can look at that little map and it'll show you last where the hearing aids were detected. There's some programming for fall detection. So, you know, my other expertise is dizziness and balance. And so falls are a big concern. And so one manufacturer in particular has a fall sensor. So when it detects a fall, it will confirm, you know, do, did you have a fall? And it will send out a notification to somebody to come help you. So there's a lot of really cool advantages. Can you call somebody with, with your hearing aids or is that just? Well, so you can use Siri with your hearing aid. So you can like tap it and it will, you, you can say like, hey Siri, call my dad. And so it'll then dial from the phone. So it acts in those cases more like a Bluetooth headset would. Mm -hmm. You can set reminders. So your reminder will come through your hearing aid. So there's a bunch of like really cool tech type options. Now, if you have a patient who's not into all of that, it'll function just like a regular hearing aid too. But you have all these other options for people who are just you know, as we all know, we're tied to all of our devices. And so lots of cool things that it'll pair with the phone. You know, some of the patients don't even want to wear the hearing aids because, you know, there's a stigma associated socially with it. At least that's the perception. But this seems like it's very enticing to have yeah. all these features if, if you can, if one could afford that, perhaps. Yeah. So stigma is always going to be an issue, I think. When the big gigantic bluetooth headpieces started coming out probably what 10 years ago but the audiology community was like oh, crossing our fingers and hoping that as people wore more things on their ears out in public that some of that stigma would reduce and i think we have seen some reduction in stigma in in some cases especially when you combine that with these more cosmetically appealing options like the receiver and the canal product mm -hmm. but yeah there's always going to be people who have some stigma against wearing a hearing aid or you know the fact that wearing a hearing aid may indicate that i'm old or that I can't hear and I can't function. And so, you know, there's always gonna be part of that. If there's no more options, mm -hmm. or they absolutely refuse a hearing aid, is there something that they could get? Perhaps I, I, I heard something about a, a pocket talker. What, what is that exactly? So there's pocket talkers and there's other OTC products. So pocket talkers are kind of larger. They're like a box with a microphone and headphones. So, you know, 
I, I think for daily use, they would be a little bit cumbersome, but for really niche situations, they're really great. You know, patients who are hospitalized, patients who are in hospice care or in palliative care where they need to hear people, but you know, you either don't have time or, you know, you can't manage the hearing aids. These are kind of quick options to use. The other option it really would be the new over-the-counter products. On your suggestion, I gave one of my patients a pocket talker and he absolutely loved it. Yeah. And he, he didn't leave the house without it. So Good. You know, I learned it's like practically a, a big microphone with a with a headset basically. And anybody can use it and you can pop it on. We have a couple in our clinic. So if patients come in who have really significant hearing loss and have no amplification, we can throw that on them so that they can hear us as we talk to them, do our history, counsel them. I do think, you know, clinics who have older adults in them, it may be nice to have a pocket talker in your clinic for those situations where somebody does come in with significant hearing loss and can't communicate because being able to hear your healthcare provider is really important when trying to, to come up with a treatment plan and, and you know a plan for for you know their future health care. Now over the counter hearing aids, that's what I hear about uh, that just came out in October. What's the difference with over the counter hearing aids versus just actually going to somebody like yourself and getting them fitted? Yeah, so over-the-counter products did come out in October. So um, this was changed um, in Congress and we have been waiting for it to occur. So over-the-counter products are basically what they are. So patients can go to Walgreens and buy hearing aids off the shelf. So what's really the difference is that with hearing aids provided by an audiologist, we're going to do a comprehensive hearing evaluation, make sure that there's not an underlying issue that needs to be maybe addressed by a physician or ENT. There will be programming that's very specific to the patient. They'll be counseling on how to use the hearing aids and how to get the best utilization out of the hearing aids. And we can fine tune them and we know what we're giving them. We can verify that the volume that we're giving them is the amount that they should have based on their hearing loss. So products over the counter aren't gonna have any of that other support. It's gonna be a product and, and they're gonna be good devices. It's not that they're gonna be terrible devices. They're gonna be good devices. They're not gonna be as cheap as I think people thought they were going yeah, how to much, be. How much would they be? Yeah, so I've seen hearing aids on the shelf for about $900. So when you look at over-the-counter products for five, six, nine hundred dollars versus two thousand for a very basic instrument from an audiologist, when you consider the fact that you're going to get a different type of warranty, you're going to get care, you're going to get fine-tuning, verification from an audiologist, there's not really going to be much difference as far as the product, but it's the service that's going to be different. I would imagine the fine-tuning is very important because a common problem when they first put the hearing aids on is that it's just an intense sound, they're not used to it, and maybe they would need your guidance on that or some fine tuning. Yeah, and if you think about wearing hearing aids as like a rehabilitation, right? So if you come from a background in rehabilitation, the one thing you know is that you have to kind of push yourself a little bit. If you don't kind of push, you're never gonna improve. And so one thing we can see sometimes is that patients will, if they're allowed to self-program, some patients will self-program directly to their hearing loss so that there's really very little amplification that they're getting because that's what they're used to listening to. Or they'll just be providing only a small amount of amplification that's not going to really improve things. As audiologists, we kind of tread this fine line between really pushing for audibility, right? Because that's what we want to do is we want to make sure sounds are audible in their environment but also realizing that people have different preferences, people need time to ease into that. So like in hearing aids, we can set up a climatization. So we can say over the next month that we wanna gradually increase the volume to, to get them to that kind of target point where you're not gonna necessarily have that in an over-the-counter product. Right, so over-the-counter roughly $800, $900. Yeah. A pocket talker is? Oh, about like 100 $100. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Where can the audience find more resources on this whole topic about hearing and hearing aids? Yeah, so from a you know professional standpoint, the American Academy of Audiology has resources, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association has resources. There are some more patient-driven resources out there. 
like the Hearing Loss Association of America has some patient-driven resources. But the two main organizations, um, the American Academy of Audiology and the American Speech Language Hearing Association, they're going to have also directories of where you can refer a patient to an audiologist in your area as well. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise with our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaffney. It's been a pleasure having this discussion with you. Thank you for having me. Please stay tuned for upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter experts.